felt called to the mission field, but I didn't know it would be Brazil. I just knew that God wanted me on some mission field. And so I surrendered to go anywhere He would call me. And it wasn't until the second year of Bible college that I felt really impressed by the Holy Spirit that the deal would be with you. Many have wondered, how does a girl who grew up in Southwest Missouri and then worked as a legal secretary find herself years later in a remote swamp in Brazil, South America? High Streets have the privilege to be the sending church of a lot of missionaries over the years. But there's none that we're more proud to say we were the sending church than Marjorie Browning. Her family moved to Springfield when she was in high school because her dad wanted them to attend High Street as a family. Marjorie was to get married, but then was diagnosed with a fatal disease. So she broke off the engagement, not wanting to put the young man through that experience. It ended up being a misdiagnosis. She still went on to Bible college to follow God's call upon her life. I went to Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri and graduated in 1957. She started feeling called to missions, then she felt called to Brazil, and then she first went to Brazil in 1960. Before I came to Brazil, thought about how long will I stay. To me, it was going to be my life work. What I've done all these years has just been part of my life. It, it's something that I feel God called me to do. When I left the States to come to Brazil in 1960, I had a promise of $200 a month. My support was sufficient then, even being in language school, and it has been up to now. It has increased. I never visited new churches to raise more support on the furloughs I went back, but for some reason it has increased along with the needs. And now my support would be normally between 1200 and 1300 a month. When you think about Marjorie, you have to think of a faithful person. She knew what God called her to do. She followed that call and she went to Brazil. She was determined to make a difference in the lives of many Brazilians, no matter what difficulties she would encounter. Marjorie has been a wonderful example of dedication, faithfulness, and service for all of us. Before Marjorie moved to a remote area of Brazil, she lived and worked in Sao Paulo for 13 years. Marjorie joined up with BBFI missionaries, the Bartons, traveling by jeep or other means deep into Brazil's northern interior to assist a Bible Institute graduate in starting a church, one of many that the Bartons helped establish in that area. Marjorie followed God's leading to move to that undeveloped area to a small town called Novalanda in 1973. It's in that northern region where God has used Marjorie to impact lives of many people. Her ministry has encouraged the churches as they have grown and reached out into other small towns. However, Marjorie was ready to reach out even further, further than most others would, to a place that was mostly unreached. I was helping in a church in Nova Orlando where I'd been for many years. And I had been here in the swamps on trips, horseback trips, and I saw the need here because service would, services would be held here occasionally, but there was no one living here in the meantime to encourage the people that would be saved or that would need to keep on hearing the gospel. And uh, when I told the people of the church 
my plans. The pastor, even from the pulpit, gave me some pretty strong advice that I should not come here, I should stay there. I told them at that time I was willing to stay there or come here. If they had a couple in the church or a person who would be willing to come and work in the swamp, I would be willing to stay there. But no one volunteered, so I did. I knew what it was like, but I was determined that uh, I would get used to it, become accustomed. And uh, if all the other people can leave here, why can't I? I'm a human being also. So I really didn't leave with any fear of anything up here, more than a fear that I'd have in any, anywhere else I would live. The only uh, thing that has been harder, and especially since I've moved over to the swamp, is the lack of communication. Marjorie lives in one of those areas where you literally can't get there from here. The name of this place is called Two Brothers Swamp. This is a farming area, some might say, but really, this area is not even good for most crops. The main thing they raise there is sugarcane, and most of the people make liquor from the sugarcane. I traveled in the back of a pickup truck with Dr. Baird, our former mission director, for over 300 miles through sand and rugged terrain. It was pretty remote for sure. One of the most exciting trips that my wife and my daughters and I ever had was we were able to go see Marjorie um, where she lived there in the interior of Brazil. There was not a much harder place to get to than where she lived, and she would always tell us, you can't get here. And we found out you almost really can't get there, but we, we were able to make it. It was very exciting to see her works. We met her first when Bob spoke at a missionary retreat in Brazil, and we stayed in a two-bedroom home with Marjorie. We got to know her quite well, and so Bob told her, he said, we're gonna to come to visit you. And she said, no, you won't. She said, nobody from the States has ever come to visit me. But we did. My amazement of her and my appreciation of her grew by leaps and bounds the time we were on that trip. Everybody there in that little village, it wasn't even much of a village, but they loved her and she loved them and the children loved her. As Ascending Church, you know, we take responsibility for our missionaries and we want to help them uh, not only get to the field, we obviously want to help them with financial support, but we also want to help them with special projects. You know, we've had a lot of missionaries ask us for help with vehicles, for different things, but with Marjorie, her need was a horse. And so once we were able to help her buy a horse, uh, we actually gave her more money than she needed and she wouldn't keep it, so she sent it back for us to use for another mission project. I always make my trips to Nova London by horse because of the distance. Retrieving the mail was always an adventure for Marjorie. Her mail was normally delivered to Nova Londa. Now remember, it was eight hours away by horse. It's deep sand beginning here. When I get over to the next swamp where we have a church, uh, I always stop there so that my horse can rest a little. I usually need to see somebody there. Horseback trips involved more than just saddling up her horse and taking off. At first, Marjorie didn't even have a fenced pasture where she kept her horse. She just turned it loose to graze out in the open. So when I get ready a day before, usually before a long trip, I go out looking for my horse. I always put a bell around his neck so it's not too hard to find. I can hear him if I'm, at least if I'm close enough. And I have to go bring my horse in, feed him, take them down to the river and wash them and get them ready for the trip the next day. After our visit in 2002, we returned and told her story to her sending church. For a long time, she would have to go out with a bell and find her horse because there was no fencing, there was no area to keep it. So we helped her buy a piece of land so she could keep her horse and she wouldn't have to spend several hours each time she needed to go for a ride to another village to check on another ministry, and she was able to get that quicker so that she could make her trip.
Eventually, she got cancer of the tongue. Half of it was removed and it changed her speech a little. We went to Dallas to see her in the hospital. Then, not too long after that, she came to Springfield to see Bob and told him that she was going to go back to Brazil. He did his very dead level best to talk her into staying a little longer to where she could recuperate better and, and get her strength back. But she told him, she said, Brother Baird, I love you, but I, I'm going back now. And she did. There were times that I would say, Marjorie, won't you come back to the States and take a little break? She said, why? This is home. This is where I belong. This is where I want to live. And this is where I want to die. When I have some minor illness, I, I have a medical book. I look in it and take some pills if I need to. Only one time I had to make a trip out of here. About two years ago, I had a high fever for 12 days and I took antibiotics and I didn't do anything for it. So I had to make a trip out to Hemus, which is also the town where I go to a bank, went to a doctor. Luckily, a, a car did come here after a uh, pickup. After 12 days, I was able to get out and go to a doctor. But there is no medical facility of any kind here. The most accommodating area of her home is the one she uses for ministry. It's just a plain building with a small area for her to cook and live in with a few extra rooms to do ministry. Uh, she had no vehicle. Well, for that matter, she had no running water. She had no electricity. She had no uh, transportation of any sort. She had no mail delivery. I have a good place for washing dishes. It's actually outside on an open back porch. There's really no electricity here, but I do have a sol solar panel, which gives lighting at night, except in the rainy seasons when the battery runs down some there. times there's no light. I have a little kitchen, about five by eight feet, where I have a small stove and a little space to work in. The stove I have is uh, a small butane gas stove. During the rainy season, getting water is no problem. I have a barrel that catches water from the roof. But most of the time it doesn't rain here, so I make trips with two buckets down to the creek, carry water back from all of my needs. I also have a small bedroom, a little larger than the kitchen, and I sleep on a small folding cot with a, a mattress about that thick, an inch maybe. But it's comfortable. Marjorie was one of the most unique people I have ever met. How she was so loving and kind and, and uh, never complained. She was a faithful person and she knew what God had called her to do. She was one of the happiest people I ever met. And she had a great sense of humor. She was, a, she was a, an amazing person. When Dr. Baird and I arrived and stayed there in Two Brothers Swamp with Marjorie Browning, she had her little area where she lived, and she had a larger room where she had uh, the children to meet and the ladies to meet, and then another room off to the side that had two uh, wooden frames for beds, single beds. So that's where Dr. Baird and I stayed, in that small room. Well, at night, when it was dark, couldn't really see anything, we heard this noise of fluttering going on, and as I lay there, I could feel the wind brushing over my face. And it was the wind from the wings of bats. Now that was strange enough, and it was kind of hard to sleep at first, but eventually we fell asleep. So the next day, I'm thinking, where are the bats? Where did they go? So we began to look around a little bit. I went into the room, got on my knees, looked under the bed frames, and there under the bed, all the bats were hanging upside down under the bottom of the bed frame. That was pretty interesting. There are no large church buildings, no Bible colleges, no monuments that will testify of the work of Marjorie Browning, but her work is reflected in the faces of those whose lives she has touched. She always said, you know, because I can't preach, I can't be a church planter. 
But we were able to see a lot of churches planted because she worked with ladies and children. And then when the young men got older, they went to Bible college, they came back there and started churches. So she was a very instrumental part of starting churches all throughout the interior of Brazil. Uh, in the house I live in, there's a, a fairly large room at the front. And so when we have our services here, or Sunday school, I arrange the benches around so that people can sit down. I put floor mats down on the floor to hold the ones that there are no benches for. And that's where we have our services on Sunday school meetings. Another important part of Marjorie's ministry is to teach the local Christians how to train and build up more disciples in their community. She always felt that this was important to keep the gospel message going from generation to generation. Every Sunday morning we have a Sunday school class for children from three years up to 15 years old or whatever age they come. And uh, also I started a ladies Bible study with one Christian lady who was living here at the time and her neighbors and anyone else who wanted to come. That's held once a week. There is no regular church service here where I live. There is no man to preach. When we have services, uh, our pastor from the next swamp over rides his mule over here and has a Sunday night service and then goes back home. But it's not every Sunday. It would be every two or three weeks or whenever he can come. At the age where many are looking forward to retiring, Marjorie was still looking for new opportunities to serve. I also have known about another swamp farther away called uh, Zacharias Swamp or Salt Swamp. Over in Zacharias Swamp, there's a girl probably 22 years old who lives there. And uh, on my first visit there, or second, I became acquainted with her. She is an epileptic and uh, during an attack had fallen into fire and got a bad, bad burn on her leg. And uh, you know, there's no medical treatment in these places, so the infection became worse and worse. And, and it, uh, from what I understood, she got gangrene, and so had to go to Sao Paulo for treatment. Well, the only treatment was to amputate her leg. I don't know how she can walk on crutches in the deep sand. It's hard enough with two feet. But she insists on going with me up and down the swamps with, on crutches, inviting the people giving out tracts and all, and is always present in the services also. After seeing that Marjorie's focus was more on the spiritual than on the physical, when asked about her financial needs, she replied this way. Prayer will do so much more than money will here, because money will buy some things, but some things we don't even have. And God through prayer can give everything we need to us. So I really appreciate it when I get a letter from somebody saying, I've been praying for you. There have been many times and we're in situations where God is the only one who can help us all. Marjorie lived very meagerly without many things in her home, except the necessities. On November 12, 2014, Marjorie was in her living room, on her knees, praying to God. A 15-year-old boy entered the house to rob her. He was startled to see her, and she was startled to see him. The boy hit Marjorie over the head with a club, and she died soon thereafter. Think about it this way. At one moment, she was praying to her Lord, and the next moment, she was in his presence. One of the saddest phone calls that I've ever received was when I got a call that Marjorie Browning had been killed. I wanted to try to figure out how to get back to Brazil for her funeral. But that's a country they don't embalm, and so there wasn't time. But it was just bittersweet because we know that she passed away right where she wanted to be. She went straight into the arms of her Heavenly Father. And so 
We know that she wouldn't change anything, even the way it happened. It was definitely a very devastating day for us uh, as a church, as her family, um, to just get that call that she had passed away. The entire town, all the surrounding area, everyone showed up for her funeral, walking down Main Street behind her casket, going to, uh, to the graveyard. Uh, was just a sight that you don't see very often. And that showed the respect that that community had for her. I was able to go back the following month to help uh, distribute uh, her affairs, uh, help with her house, just some of that. And it was, again, it was very sad, but it was just exciting to see so many people come up to me and tell me what she meant to them how much her ministry had meant to that area and how many people uh, had came to know Christ because of her witness and her example and just the way that she just continually ministered throughout her 55 years in Brazil. Marjorie's support was not very high. She didn't really feel like she needed a lot. Her support was never more than $1,200 a month. On her financial reports, she would cross out the word vehicle in the vehicle expense line and write in the word horse. Usually that expense amounted to $2.50 a month. Over the years, she would take what she had left over from her personal allowance and send it to her nephew who then invested it for her. When she passed away, her nephew called us and said, Marjorie has invested a little over the years and it has grown. He said she left directions for it. I said, that's great. You can go ahead and send it to us with her instructions. He said, I think it's a little more than what you might be thinking. It has grown to $400,000. Needless to say, I was shocked. And then he proceeded to explain that she wanted to do this to help new missionaries going to the field for the first time. She wanted those funds to pay for their airfare and their shipping of all their belongings. I was totally amazed by her desire to make a difference even after the Lord called her home. Marjorie Browning was a modern day hero in the faith. I remember the very first time I heard the name Marjorie Browning. It was in 2002, and I was at a chapel service at Baptist Bible College. They showed a video that Dr. Bob Baird had done about her. They called her the One Horse Woman. I remember being struck by her obedience to leave her home and her family to go to Brazil as a single woman. That took a lot of courage. Marjorie's obedience, kindness, generosity and strength to continue what God had called her to do has been an inspiration to my husband and me, and I am sure to many, many others. We're the Oreck family missionaries to the country of Wales. We just wanted to take the time to express our appreciation for the ministry and the legacy of Marjorie Browning. When our family moved to the country of Wales, it not only provided for us financially for our airfare, but it also paid of the expenses for the shipping of all of our personal belongings. It was a tremendous blessing to us, and we just want to say thank you so very much for being a blessing to our family and our ministry here in the country of Wales. My name is Allie Alexander, and I'm a missionary in Columbia, South America. I received help from Marjorie Browning when it came time for me to move to Bogota. I had just spent a year and a half traveling around to churches and sharing my heart for the Colombian people with them. And to know that my airfare and shipping expenses would be covered was a tremendous blessing. I cannot express how grateful I am for Marjorie Browning and the sacrifices that she made so that missionaries like myself could be blessed in this way. Marjorie Browning's life speaks clearly to that which should be important in the life of every believer. 
not just in the life of a missionary. First, her life portrays an unquestioning surrender of all that she is and has to the will of God. Second, she exemplifies a total commitment to the glory and honor of her Savior and the amplification of Jesus' name among a needy and remote people of the planet. And then third, she illustrates simplicity of life, an understanding and commitment to the fact that God has a high purpose for her that supersedes all other interests, including a mate, family, and material things. This produces a deep sense of fulfillment and contentment, regardless of life's circumstances. Marjorie Browning was a godly woman, and she has left and is still leaving an impact on the lives of a remote people, her adopted family, who would have not known of Jesus Christ if she had not surrendered to God and gone to them. This is what Project 938 is all about, praying for more people to surrender and go to the multitudes who are searching for relief from their burdens and sins and hope of life after death. Jesus is the answer to both. His death on the cross was for our sins and his resurrection gives us eternal life. There are multiplied thousands of places like the swamps of Brazil and millions of people around the world who have not yet had their Marjorie Browning come and tell them of Jesus. Would you pray for God to send more laborers and be ready if he calls you? Would you pray that those who God calls will answer the call before many people go out into everlasting eternity separated from God. If I had to do all again, all over, I would do the same thing because of, of the need and the fact that I know that the Lord wants me here and I'm perfectly happy.